Zoom. Hello, okay. everybody. Up oh, there we are. Yep. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just gonna say hello and welcome back. Um, we have a bit of a somber evening tonight, but Subiel will will tell us all why in a few. So, <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I just don't want to let the groundhog in the living room go unmentioned. And there's not very many of us here on the call this evening, but, but. Um, uh, we just got word earlier this week that one of our colleagues was found dead in his home, um, and Doug, Doug Yearout died uh, earlier this week. And I don't know, uh, I think, you know, Henrietta and Jeff and Judy and I know him. I don't think, I'm just looking to see who's here. Noel may not have ever met him, nor Vani may not have ever met him, but Doug was a really interesting guy. He was uh, a strange cross between ex-military, a uh, hippie pot smoking bagpipe playing homeopath who spent a lot of time with wildlife and birds and exotics and all sorts of other species and and really um, basically wore his heart on his sleeve his practice was out in uh, Stevens Washington which is in the Everett area and he also had uh, some property that actually was his mother's property closer to the coast and uh, would have these growling fights with his crazy neighbor there who kept pouring pesticides on the trees and and that sort of stuff and Doug and I uh, Doug was in that group that studied with us in the early 90s at, at Richard's course so with uh, Glenn Dupree and I and Scott Hoskett and Cindy Lankana was in that class and I don't remember was Henrietta were you in that class Henrietta were you the year before Anyway, uh, he had a he had a really interesting he had a really interesting uh, really interesting practice. He was a really deep thinker. Uh, uh, um, did all the sound and stuff for a lot of the ABH meetings, um, and uh, did some presentations at the ABH meetings as well. And uh, um, yeah, it was a he was a really uh, like I say a really interesting deep thinker, uh, kind of quiet. Uh, guy wrestled with the world a lot, um, had some great tattoos, played in a bagpipe band, uh, and was a pretty good, serious homeopath. Like I say, he uh, he uh, he wore his heart on his sleeve for for sure. There's, I'm I'm sure we've all got some good good Doug stories, and I can't imagine what's going on in this practice right now. You know, with people, uh, you know, I don't know who's looking after his dogs and and. Uh, um, much less who's looking after his clients. So just want to raise a glass and say a prayer and light a candle in our own ways to, to him. He's going to leave a big physical hole, but I'm sure he's going to be active in other places. He's got a he's got a really good website actually. He wrote for a he wrote for an interesting. Um, he wrote a column for a local paper, so all of those columns are up on his website. He's got some pretty cool uh, quotes and and stuff that about uh, you know that just some old Einstein quotes and and that sort of stuff about how interconnected the world is. He also taught at a um, he taught at a sort of an outdoor school and did a lot of uh, teaching about wild crafting and making salves and medicines and all those sorts of stuff. And I can remember one time he was going to. He's going to teach me about tracking and stuff. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm I'm often in work boots, and he decided that it probably wasn't a good idea that I learned to track when I was wearing my work boots because they would make they would make too many big big tracks in the woods. So I needed to get I needed to get some more appropriate footwear and learn how to walk if we were going to track. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So I don't know what uh, I don't know what else folks want to do tonight. I don't know if it's quiet enough, Jeff, that you can open all the microphones. Um, Bob, I, I think it would be kind of interesting again to continue what we've been doing for the last couple of um, for the last couple of sessions, which is which is basically having rather calm free for all, um, where um, you know cases or things that are on folks' minds or questions or concerns or inspiration or 
clinical pearls or um, stuff get get um, get thrown out uh, uh, to to get some feedback, both from those of us who are on the panel, but also the folks who are attending. Uh, I think if you add it up, we've got probably more than 20 years of uh, homeopathic experience in the trenches, and and uh, it would I I really enjoy having some of these kinds of discussions to see what folks are thinking about things. Your latest, most favorite organ on aphorism or strange clinical stuff or something cool that happened this month or some magic stuff that happened with one of your cases or something like that. So are you ready? I'm going to unmute I'm all the mics. You're ready. Yeah, so you guys who are multitasking, feeding the dog, running the blender. Well, they're all muted, so... <laughs> Dave, me, Kevin, um, that uh, they're now unmuted on our end, but um, everyone, you've got a mute and unmute button, so you can just hit your unmute. I'm not quite sure what it says, but let me just say mute. I'd also entertain old dead guy homeopath stories with, uh, as I say, raise a glass later this evening in Doug's honor. So, Sue, you had mentioned that you had gotten some feedback about what Judy was saying last time? Just some general feedback uh, from, from folks that just found that um, format helpful and found it useful to, to um, uh, have that kind of open discussion about clinical experience and what works for them in their practice. Uh, whether it's with case management or practice management or wrangling clients or you know wrangling billing and invoicing and and that that sort of stuff you know the the that kind of stuff that that we deal with in practice all the time whether we practice as solo practitioners or whether we practice with staff or whether we practice homeopathy as part of a larger practice of veterinary medicine and you know how how that works and how that works for you know each individual person finding their way and how that other colleagues and clinicians might be able to take that and model that into something that could work for their practice as well. It's probably not easily franchisable, in spite of what of one of my clients assured me that he could franchise my practice. <laughs> um, but but I think that that in that quilt that we all make you know, of, of a practice that works for us. I think that sometimes it's helpful to get those little tidbits from folks. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, that's what I've been thinking about pretty much for a couple of years and published uh, now the third article that's I think hopefully going to be impress impressing Jeff. Uh, um, Basically, that everyone can do the same thing by following the simple rules that bridge homeopathy and conventional care, which is based on energy management. How so? Um, in that homeopathy and other modalities that work with mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms of the body, actually conserve energy by not getting translation of new proteins um, due to the use of antibiotics and other antis. Um, and that that's, for example, the reason why cats sleep so long and heal so well. At least according to some people say that that's a theory, obviously. But it's not a theory that translation, RNA, protein, you know, protein produced from RNA, the translation is the most consuming energy uh, process in the body. And everything else is secondary, whether you call it physical energy or what we deal with, which is energy, you know, vitality, vital force. And, and, that, you're, and you're saying that the body wants to conserve that energy? Right, correct. Right. That it works better, that every physiologic 
process in the body, it can only work optimally if it has the sufficient ATP if you want to measure it. In the lab, it would be what ATP or NAD, and that every symptom that we see is basically a biomarker that guides us back to conservation of energy. So that would translate then the, the way when, when I can speak as a homeopath so that the body puts the symptoms in the relatively least harmful place for the overall function of that individual. <laughs> that, and, makes, that makes sense, yeah. Right. And, 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 and that, that it puts things in the relatively most exterior and the relatively most functional sensational place that it can because to to interdigitate with what your your hypothesis is that those things would be relatively more energy conserving in the total economy of that individual that is a really really good point so i'm sorry to hijack this conversation but obviously this is my soapbox um now I think you're getting into the metaphysical part of the science of homeopathy. Because no, I don't believe that's correct. I don't believe that the energy conservation of different tissues is the basis of the production of symptoms. So carry on. I guess I never thought of that. But, you know, I mean, it makes sense, and, but but if you read the organized, you know, Hahnemann says you can do homeopathy without any of that metaphysical stuff. And this kind of goes back to what you were talking about, the franchise, too, is it's not these, and this is, uh, now I finally, 20 some odd years later, realized this is why I was so confused after the second Richard class where he was talking about percent of homeopathy that people were practicing. I mean, you're either practicing this way or you're not. And everybody should be doing it the same way if they want to conserve energy or the idea is really stupid and it's, you know, it's a waste of time. So tell me more about your thoughts about how the, how the, the body's desire, whatever tendency, uh, I don't. I don't want to have you have it misinterpreted that I think this is intellectual desire. Um, so, so the body's the body's tendency to want to be in an energy conserving state. How does by, that? Well, it's by evolutionarily evolutionary, but yeah, I. As I mentioned, I actually haven't given much of any thought to the answer to what you're asking. Yeah. So uh, how does that how does that relate to how the body that individual would articulate symptoms then, or or the seat of the disease? Well, that and that's a good question. And I don't know the answer, you know, what makes something make the center of gravity of one disease in one place or another. And I guess maybe I'll think about it and have an answer in a year or two. Well, wow, 20. So, so, so back, back, let's back up even further though. So you said that, that this, this is one of the things that would allow the bridging of homeopathy in conventional medical philosophy based on energy balance. That's a that's that's all I feel. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So tell me more. That everything we do, whether we do homeopathy or not, everything we do that conserves energy balance, energy period, whether you consider it vitality, vital force, ATP, whatever, it's all the same. And that's why, you know, it's the same as conventional medicine, because this is all measured in the lab and people are publishing about this right now. The exposome is a brand new 
the molecular definition of individuality. It's a sum total of everything, including translation, transcription, products, toxic exposures. <laughs> it's crazy. And, you know, it all goes back to that goal of personalized medicine that was, you know, abandoned after they realized that the best they could hope for is precision medicine, but that's that's a different story. So, so are you suggesting that conventional care and homeopathy can serve energy in the same way? I, that... Can you restate that? What do you, what do you mean? You mean do they use the same uh, pathways that you can measure uh, lab? Well, no, mean? the same larger dynamic at, at risk of being metaphysical again. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So, so the commonality between homeopathy and conventional care is is that they attempt to conserve energy balance within the individual. That the best treatment outcomes occur when you conserve energy balance, yeah. More energy when you, yeah. So, so how do you, I, I want to take notes. It's, so the best treatment outcomes happen when you optimally conserve energy. That's what I think, and yeah. I really don't want to monopolize this conversation after you know talking about this for a while. So, um, do you want to keep? I'm I'm fascinated. And I would be happy to. I would be happy to 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 to, to push you to clarify that, not in a uh, mean way. Not but, that. No, but I love I, it. But I'm also I'm also. Um, I'm also sensitive to the fact that we're sitting in a room that has more than just you and I in there. So I'm, I, you know, like everybody else make a little noise here. <laughs> Gee, uh, who's on mute? Judy, uh, what do you think? Because my, my background is looking at the things that are different and how, 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 how the, you know, the difference between antipathic medicine and similar medicine. Right, and and that's all we're talking about, that antipathic medicine doesn't conserve energy the way similars do. That's a, it's really the... So, yeah, and, and so when you started out, you're talking about how we can bridge homeopathy and conventional care based on energy balance. So actually, it's how we can differentiate homeopathic care and conventional mm. care. Mm. Mm. Not wanting to put words in your mouth, because mm. because this is the first time I've heard you say this in this way. Mm. Okay. Mm. 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 So that kind of doesn't serve any purpose when you look at it that way. I don't know. I mean, maybe a doctor would be less prone to give an antibiotic just because it can hurt a conventional doc. That they would or they wouldn't? That they would not, that they would defer when they ordinarily would prescribe. But they know that antibiotics uh, use up energy and that their patient will have a better outcome, immune balance, uh, whatever vitality beam, um, by conserving as much energy as possible. I mean, that's one of the mechanisms of ozone and negative ions is it's been linked in the past, of course, to vitality and energy, but that's a whole different story. Now, yeah, we are getting into the metaphysical because we're talking about non-physical energy. 
I don't think which, uh, we doesn't, can discuss, which doesn't exist. <laughs> well, I don't is, think we can discuss medicine without getting into the metaphysical, but that's I agree, again my I agree personal you just bias. Have to look at the Reiki research that they're bringing into oncology units, you know, and the amazing uh, results with cancer that many of the Indian homeopaths are getting. Vijay Yikar has hundreds just of his own, right, Jude? Right, right, actually. I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of the Indian homeopaths have some amazing um, history, <clears throat> and they're willing to share too, which is nice. They seem, and I also think in India they're they're more fortunate than we are because A, the government has blessed homeopathy and B, the people are so poor they can't afford allopathic. And so you're able to see the work of the people that are dedicated to homeopathy coming through. So we can actually look at them for results on, um, in, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but we if you're gonna talk results, you can see that um through through that um that country, that um community more than anywhere else, I think, because anywhere else people are able to afford allopathic until it doesn't work and then we get to see it. And I think it's the cases are really confused a lot more than I mean, then one who hasn't been um, affected by all the external poisons and I, antibiotics and stuff. I see that happening. Um, I saw it happening with some of the cases that I know from from a couple of Indian colleagues, but I saw it happening um, in my ex in experience in Cuba as well when I was there uh, just after the World Trade Centers fell down. And I'm looking at the cases, you know, it's it's relatively easier to be led into temptation to stray off the homeopathic path in most parts of North America and and other places um, because those options are there. You know, they're either physically there, um, they're being they're being presented all the time, all the time, all the time, or people are, have the socioeconomic ability to access those things, or they're imposed upon uh, folks because of the structure of the healthcare system that that imposes those things. And, and so um, places that don't have that kind of access because of structure or economics or geography or or whatever, um, you know, are are out there maybe, you know, using different therapeutic interventions. Whereas, I think without exception, I'm just looking to see who's on the call so I don't intentionally tell a lie. But I think without exception, all of us who are on this call. Um, at least have part of our lives in a culture where people have access to a bunch of different options and have the ability to um, to to purchase, participate in, um, be swayed by, um, get nervous by, um, you know, feel threatened by, whatever those words are. The anxiety of uncertainty. Right, right. So, so you know, I saw. I saw, for example, when I was in Cuba, uh, you know, pe people who um, who would do homeopathy, they would go to the hospital. I, we actually, I can remember a particular situation where there was a person in the hospital. Uh, her son was in the hospital, and and uh, he was just in the hospital because he didn't have any medicine, you know. <laughs> So she had to go to the black market and she got him some IV fluids on the black market and she got the Kirandara lady to come and they actually killed a chicken and did some herbal stuff. And then we did some, um, uh, there, you know, did some homeopathy. And I think, 
I don't even remember if there was antibiotics or whatever on the on the black market. But it was it was this really interesting mishmash of community input, you know, from from dead chickens to homeopathic prescribing to prayer to to um, to other stuff for this hospitalized person, which is way different from the experience of most of us in North America who end up in a hospital. Uh, and it's way different. I can remember talking when when uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan first started coming to the States. I I was in in a very small, interesting room with him in um, northwestern Pennsylvania. I could probably think about what year it was, but it was just in that first six months or so that he started coming stateside uh, before some of his stuff got skewed. And, and talking about and and some of you have heard me talk about this case, you know, about somebody who hiked for three days on his father's back and then they got to somebody and borrowed a donkey and went on the donkey for however many days and went to the clinic and saw him and was treated for, a, a, he was actually treated for a, a presumptive diagnosis of an osteosarcoma and, you know, got back on the donkey and then got back on his dad's back and, you know, didn't get any follow up for you know, 18 months or two years or whatever, and, and was cured with a single dose of remedy, but, but didn't, uh, cured is relative, the, the bone lesions went away and he was up and walking and comfortable. Um, and, and, but the kid didn't have any other options, you know, like he, there, there wasn't any way that he was going to get um, conventional treatment, surgery, uh, supplements, antibiotics, ozone treatment, um, anything other than what was culturally culturally available to that child in in his in his community and i think you know i talked to i talked to my colleagues about this now like how brave do we have to be as homeopaths to not get swayed by all those other things or or for those of us who do mix in some other things to be able to gauge the potential energy conservation of those other things so that we're actually not doing de detriment, you know, as, as we're, as we're quilting together the option, optimal therapeutic um, intervention for that individual. <clears throat> I have a interesting experience um, with um, Many of us have clients who want to do supplements. And a lot of times we use supplements, like nutritional supplements and that, um, because if we do single dose and wait, the people don't do it or they don't want to or they don't understand or whatever reason. I'm thinking of newer clients versus someone who's um, educated in homeopathy. And... Um, and I had this cancer case and um, it was terminal and the remedy I was using was doing actually quite well. Um, the dog was having quality life. Um, the tumor was there, it wasn't changing. And, um, and then she came in for the recheck and uh, the dog was trying to bite me, which it never did in the 10, 15 years, you know, I think it was 10 years that I'd been treating it. Um, she had a shopping bag with her. She went online and anything that indicated you can use it for cancer, she was giving this dog. And um, so I told her I really didn't want her to do all that, which, was not greatly received. Um, and then I switched the dog to nuts. And um, what ended up happening was she would cut back on the supplements and then she would go back to the supplements and I would repeat the nuts. Um, at that time I wasn't doing cancer patients with um, uh, a do dosing every day um, and it became more frequent because she was not stopping the supplements and the odd thing about that um, I mean it's fear 
I'm dealing with her fear. Um, but this dog, in spite of the supplements, um, actually continued going pretty well for another year. Um, and it was typical that one of the, you know, the pathologist said this dog is going to die in a month if it doesn't do chemo or something like that. And the dog had another couple of years. Um, yeah. Did I cure it? No. I but don't know. Did you do better than the oncologist could do? Yeah. Um, statistically, yeah. I did. Yeah. Um, and in spite of the owner, um, the remedy was able to work through all that, all that stuff, you know, and, um, so that's just applying to whatever you were saying, Susan, and I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> but, but anyway, it um, I think it's a fear in the fact that people um, delve into, people are just plain frightened. And they're more so now than ever. Um, when I see a patient and I say, has your regular veterinarian discussed this um and they say no which is probably a lie but there's nothing in their record saying that they discussed it and um and i would give them options and they say no 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 we're not going to do chemo we're not going to do this or anything but then they want to go and see the oncologist and what i find <clears throat> because i'm not pushy in the realm of my way or the highway um i let them go see the uh, the oncologist who says if you don't do this the animal will suffer and die you know okay that's a hard <laughs> that's a hard pill to get over um so i lose a lot of clients for that and the, or i get them back um after the dog is sick or the cat is sick and now I've got a more complicated case. Um, but I think the biggest thing where the biggest block to us doing a good job is this massive fear people anxiety have. Anxiety difference? Of, yes, anxiety, fear of symptoms, of the diagnosis. And going back to energy, symptoms are a direct reflection of the body's energy, physiologic balance, and can be predicted as we do all the time as homeopaths. And you know, we're doing the cancer webinar in a couple of weeks. And you know, the two of the take homes are, you know, about predicting symptoms that the body trying to conserve energy puts, I guess too, this goes to, as close to the answer to your question. So I've ever thought that the body puts symptoms on the outside externally versus the inside in order to conserve that energy. And that in the body tries to localize a symptom versus a generalized symptom also to conserve energy, even though the symptom may, or the new quote unquote symptom may look worse whether it's an ear infection or anal sac scooting or whatever. So Judy, do you think that the biggest obstacle is the fear of the client, the fear that the client has, or do you think the biggest obstacle is the fear that the clinician might have? That the clinician might what? The fear, the fear that we as a clinician have. You know, that, um, that we're not able to stand there in our, fill up our space and just, you know, do our best work. And and so do we, blame is the word that comes quickly to mind in this conversation. That's not the totality of the concept. So, you know, do we shove that off that it's the client's fault um, because, uh, as, as opposed to it may be, you know, our fear or our, um, but I'm going to jump in and answer that, Sue, for Judy or before Judy, only because I've been wanting to say that you kind of missed the one 
biggest difference between the Uber Kant cases that will file from the Indian Homey Pass and the US Homey Pass, and the answer is the same as what you just brought up, and that is the law. Doctors are legally unable to be the primary care doctor of a cancer patient in the US. That's not the case in India. So the law is there, but our the reaction that the law has on us is ours. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm not debating that point that that yeah. a medical doctor cannot legally a medical doctor who is a homeopath cannot legally treat cancer as the primary presentation in the United States. Right. Right. They oh, can they, treat the side effects of chemotherapy, they can treat right. all sorts of other shit, but they cannot <clears throat> legally treat cancer with other right. than conventional means in the United States. So so the extension of my question is is that when I get in the room with and this is not true for veterinarians actually, it's for medical doctors and it's not true for other lay lay homeopaths. But um so when I get in the room with that individual or if I'm, you know, assessing cases or wanting to know, am I going to take this case or not take this case? Then, you know, circling back to my question, is it my fear based on my, the way that that law interdigitates with my chronic disease, <laughs> um, you know, or is it my, you know, and my client's fear, or do we sometimes just pass the ball back and forth that, and, you know, like sometimes the clinician is scared shitless and sometimes mm. the client is scared shitless. And as long mm. as we're not both scared shitless at the same time, we can usually muddle through things, you know. Mm. I think I think it's not black and white. I think, um, you know, um, like in one case that I'm thinking of that I asked, have you, you know, I'll go through and work with a patient. And let's say that it only kind of gets good and then it gets bad, it kind of gets good, get, kind of gets bad, and then it starts getting worse. And this person, and I would always offer, do you want to see a specialist? Do you want to switch? If, you know, because if I don't do that, hmm. you know, then someone's going to come back. Well, she never mentioned that, just like they did that their primary. Hmm. And, um, and yeah, is that a fear? I don't know. I suppose it's a fear, but it's also I feel that I think it's only fair to give a client that no, it's only my way. It's only my way. And if you can't do only my way, then I never want to see you again. I think that's ridiculous. And that's the black and white. And I don't think anyone who is has a successful practice. Well, I take it back. There is somebody I know who does it. Um, I'm not sure if that practice is successful, but I've gotten a lot of those clients um, because it they, basically it's my way or the highway. If you have an emergency, even though you can't reach me and you do allopathic, I'm going to fire you, which I think is really unfair. But on the other hand, to get to the point, I think when you're dealing with a scary diagnosis, I think it I think people appreciate if they have as much information as they can get. I am not upset about people who go to Dr. Google and come in with reams of paper and things they found. Because then there, we can talk about it. I also charge yeah, them for it. But yeah, we can talk about nothing, it. Nothing better than an educated client. That's what I think. I'm not afraid. I don't want a bunch of sheep. How can clients make a good decision without having all the information? And a good and a good decision for themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. um, How can clients make a good decision when they're absolutely inundated with a pile of information? You and use a protocol. You go back and resort to what you learned in vet school or med school and or give the drug or, you know, which goes back to wait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if they're loaded with a ton of information, our job from our perspective, and I always tell them that this is my perspective as a homeopath, 
this is how I see what you're bringing in and this is how I would proceed. And then they say, well, if it was your dog, well, of course, you know, I look at him. Yeah. And if I was a surgeon, I'd cut off his leg. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, you have a back and forth dialogue. Their decision is their decision. You know, it's not going to be, I didn't get, like they didn't, I get people who say, well, they didn't give me a chance. They didn't tell me I had an option. I mean, you got options allopathically. You should be able to get those options. And sometimes in the records, I find it, well, actually, they did discuss it with you. It's written right here. Oh, I forgot. Hmm. And many times it's, they don't write it down. And so I don't know if they discussed it or not. But I think it's only fair to the client that there is a give and take conversation on how to proceed with treatment before. And if I'm going to take a case, if they're already, yep, I'm here for homeopathy, I say, okay, that's, you know, here we go, you know. And usually those are the cases who've already been to the oncologist or the dermatologist or, mm. you know, Joe Schmo and already spent, you know, three to five thousand dollars and then they come to me oh you're so expensive <laughs> you know and it's like yeah right and um you know but um i feel sorry for clients um and people that that follow the the dogma that they hear and the fear and you also asked a question, is it, are we dealing with our fear? And that reminded me of um, Anthony. Anthony and I were leading a discussion um, at- For you guys uh, who don't know, this is Anthony Kravitz, who's a colleague of ours. Right, and we were at, at Richard's um, advanced session down at the camp, not the camp, but the ranch. And the question that came up was, why is it that we can treat a patient allopathically or a patient can be treated allopathically, it goes south, and the answer is we've done all we could. We tried and we failed. I am so sorry. And you go home, you have dinner, you enjoy your wife, you watch a movie and you go to bed. Most people, and, not all. And you, you know the answer to that because we've talked about it. Right. Because we but, know you can do better than what they you know, what they think. So here's the and the other thing is that here we are as homeopaths. If we do not solve the case, cure the case, even if it's a case that can only be palliated, we failed. And what kind, and if you look at those two scenarios, you know, one is accepted mm. and one, if you fail as a homeopath, well, homeopathy doesn't work, you're a charlatan, and who knows what you're thinking of in your head. You're thinking probably not that you're a charlatan, is like, oh, if I was only smarter, if I knew the materia medica more, if I had reread Organon one more time, if I... You know, if I referred it to another homeopath, if I, you know, whatever. And it's interesting um, to me that um, I would say most of the people who are homeopaths fall into that trap. And that. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Judy, I think that some of that depends, too, on how relatively healthy we are. Mm-hmm. That goes, that goes back, you know, that goes back for a whole bunch of conversations. Um, and, and the relatively more healthy we are, the less relatively fear-based we are. As we're talking, guys, I want to share my screen with you. Um, Judy was talking about black and white, and we've talked about that in the past, and I've talked about shades of gray in the past, and I want to just show some um, song lyrics that were written by a friend of mine, Tom Griffith, and Tom's a musician and homeopath, and uh, 
he studied with me and Gregory Pace and a few other friends and colleagues uh, when we did uh, David Kramer's uh, four-year course at the Hudson Valley School, his Master's of Homeopathy course. And, and he writes a song called A Thousand Shades of Grey. Um, and as I said in the top of the words that I wrote, you know, I think that a lot of this is how we interact as patients and practitioners, between practitioners and disease, and between practitioners and ourselves. But it's a, it's a really beautiful, beautiful uh, song. And every time I hear about black and white, um, I think about I mm. think about this song. Uh, so I, I'll just share it with you. The, the music is totally amazing. But, but I, I do think, Judy, circling back, that it also depends on how relatively healthy we are as clinicians as well, so that we're able to fill up our space and have some confidence in our competence that isn't um, pushy or arrogant or fear-based or threatening or, you know, so, you know, so that you could actually say to somebody, you know, like, basically, you know, this is what I have to offer and, and I'm happy to walk on this trail with you. Um, but I'm not going to drag you kicking or screaming and I'm not going to do a bunch of stuff that goes contrary to my sort of heart and soul and right relation and, and, and that, that sort of stuff. And I think that's, um, that's a hard path to walk <laughs> consistently and, and stuff. But I do, I do really think that that part of doing this work, um, and, you know, we're back to the metaphysics and the heart and soul of this work, too, is, is as, and, and, and a bit into uh, Jeff's thing that I don't totally understand yet, but, but you would conserve more energy as a healthy, relatively balanced individual rather than somebody who's coming home and tearing your hair out because of this interaction with this client or you've baited with this certain thing that they said or thing they wanted to do or, or whatever. So, so this is Henrietta. I'll just show you the end of the, it's just the chorus again. <laughs> so does any of our, attendees have any thoughts on the discussion so far or what they think of um, how they handle the cases, clients, from what or Judy helped as you become relatively more healthy. <laughs> Anybody want to jump in? Cynthia, Robin, Rosie, Danny, Thea. I had a discussion with some colleagues the other night about what is treatable with homeopathy. And what isn't, and what makes a case a homeopathy case versus some other kind of case. What, what does that mean? How do you mean? <laughs> What do you mean by it's a homeopathic case or it's not? Well, you're, you're talking to me who's a boring old Hanumanian homeopath. So I, I see, you know, short of things that are, well, and this is also part of homeopathy, you know, short of things that are, you know, exceptional errors in diet and lifestyle and, and, and those sorts of things, uh, you know, obstacles and, and that sort of, I I think that I think that 
if we keep the hygiene and that part of homeopathy in the equation, I think all cases are homeopathy cases. <laughs> That's what I was about to say, is that right. there's so, only right. one criteria for homeopathy, and that's if you're alive and your body is able yeah, to do anything. <laughs> yeah. but, and we but have we, no idea how much the body can heal. Exactly. And, and but, but, you know, we also know, Jeff, that some of our colleagues have determined that you know, this is a homeopathy case or this isn't or uh, and, and that has more to do with sometimes the circumstance, uh, the where the client may be, where the animal may be, uh, where a whole bunch of complex things rather than the actual ability of um, well prescribed art and science of the fullness of homeopathy to to be able to affect change and mm. and you know ob obviously on the you know the vitality of the individual and and that sort of stuff but that vitality doesn't necessarily make it a homeopathy case or not a homeopathy case but um you know for that that's an interesting i i i hear that some some so some folks uh, a lot of the time. And on a totally unrelated vein, with only a few minutes left, so were you in Cuba around the time of Lepto? No, I was I was there. Um, I was there uh, two, three and a half weeks after the World Trade Center fell down. So in two thousand one, October. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and and um, worked with a. Uh, we were working with medical doctors and veterinarians, and while the medical doctors and the veterinarians got along very well as humans one on one, the structure was such that um, we we did not interact in the same room. Uh, we did at some party, like a party and some luncheons and. And that sort of stuff, but but we we taught separately, um, and it was the first time I went to Cuba with uh, no Spanish, <laughs> um, and and uh, it was the first time anybody had come to teach veterinary homeopathy specifically, and to do materia medica and 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 that sort of stuff. And I actually have my teaching notes. Um, I've got a really interesting volume of my teaching notes that have got my my writing on them in Spanish, so I can talk Spanish like Yoda. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't be sure I could ask what I wanted for breakfast. And it was really interesting because there were situations where people would talk to me about homeopathy, like pure homeopathy or about making remedies or about making pellets or about those sorts of things. They would talk to me in Spanish, and I, I, I truly don't know what happened. It was... Yeah. Um, magic, truly some magic thing that went from mm. my heart to their heart. But they mm. would talk to me in Spanish and I would understand completely what they were saying. And it mm. frickin' drove Carl Robinson nuts because he kept <laughs> saying, you keep saying you don't know any Spanish. It's like, I don't know Spanish, but when he talks, I can understand what he's saying. You know, like, <laughs> don't ask me. Where would you me. know if you talk to Carl? Do you know, were they seeing a lot of lepto cases at that time? Or the cases not? that we saw were not, I didn't, we didn't see any lepto cases that I know of. We used to go at night after our teaching duties were done and people would come to where we were staying and and I had a I had my remedy kit like a for, we didn't have any remedies you know go, go figure but I travel with my my little remedy kit you know so I had my remedy kit and Carl borrowed my remedy kit and we would go and we would take cases at in the evenings and and, and after and people would come and you know Carl has better Spanish than I have and but he has rudimentary Spanish and or had he's better even now than he was and we would take these cases but no I, I don't remember any any uh any lepto cases there were some cancer cases and some serious stuff and some emotional stuff and some hormonal stuff and uh, i remember uh, i remember like three or four human cases of anthrax you know cutaneous anthrax and um 
and that sort of stuff. But I don't remember uh, specifically lepto cases when I was there. You could give me a machete, a Spanish English dictionary, and a and a box of remedies, and I would go back. <laughs> it was really, you know, we we lived um, we lived really simply in uh, Casa Particulares in in uh, San Fuego or in Santiago, I mean, in Habana City, and we lived at a uh, a government kind of hostel thing. Uh, when when we were in San Fuego and it was it was really amazing you know nobody had anything and they were just so happy to share it with us and you know nobody had books I left my stethoscope with the head of cardiology at one of the hospitals and I you know they they wanted to get one repertory and one materia medica in each of the offices of the veterinary offices in the 14 provinces so people could go and access them there. So there was a lot of memory, rote memory stuff, uh, you know, people transcribing notes. Uh, they would have their calendars or like a paper and they would have a book that, like the day book, you know, that you would use as a calendar and then they would turn it uh, 90 degrees and they'd write crosswise in a different color of pencil and then they'd turn it a third back and then so they'd write at the 45 degree angle in a different color of pencil because nobody had any paper and um yeah and everywhere you went you know people would have they would have make these coffees for you these tiny little these tiny little uh like demi tasse of this really strong coffee and uh really sweet and you would go i mean the cab came to pick us up the the it wasn't even a taxi it was a private driver sort of thing came to pick us up one morning at five o'clock it was dark it was pouring rain and the household lady would bring the would bring the, the the coffee out to the curb and we would all have to have coffee in the middle of, of the pouring rain it was really amazing but no no lepto cases that i was aware of okay, okay. well let's wrap it up unless we have any further thoughts i just want to thank you very much sue for letting me air my wacko ideas oh, i'd love to hear more of that oh <laughs> anytime yeah yeah and are we i guess we've got one more month that we're doing these yep, guys one more i still haven't heard i'm i'm still trying to get some um some stuff set up for uh from some oncology stuff, but I'm having some trouble raising the clinicians, uh, not getting a lot of response from the email, so we may have to have that at a different time. Hmm. So I just, uh -huh. I just like to encourage everybody, you know, for those of us who knew uh, Doug and his physical body to, to uh, just have some memories, and for those of you who didn't, um, yeah, we're happy to tell tales. So as I say candles and prayers and raise a glass in the way that's meaningful to you. Right on that note, I think we will go and see you next month or hopefully see some of you guys. Are you going to Chicago to Lombard? I don't think I'm going to be able to make it now. Um, uh, Judy, you're, you're going, right? Yep, Adriana, Henrietta and I, for sure. Oh, good. Great. I could still get a wild hair, probably, but I don't think I'm going to be able to go. Yeah. Better decide quick, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can, yep. Well, so we'll see you next month um, or in a couple of weeks, either way, but thank you all for coming. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.